60 AD. Rome is at its height. But in its most remote outpost, the empire is about to be hit by the full fury of a woman's wrath. Her anger will kill 70,000 and defy Roman power in Britain. The Romans degraded a mother and abused her daughters. They would pay a heavy price. Boudicca, queen of the Iceni, would have her revenge. Boudicca means victory, so she was Queen Victoria of the Iceni, a proud but relatively small tribe in eastern Britain. They were descended from Celts who arrived in 500 BC from northern France and Belgium. The Iceni were strong, independent and quite wealthy, and they mixed with the even more ancient Britons who built the great stone circles such as these at Stonehenge. These stones were raised over three and a half thousand years before Christ, or Boudicca. Meanwhile on the continent, a superpower had grown, swallowing whole countries and civilizations on its march towards Britain. By 60 AD, the Roman Empire had conquered a quarter of the world's people through a powerful combination of military might and tempting trade agreements. To Boudicca's husband, Prasutagus, king of the Iceni, such trading pacts had been just too good to refuse. Edem in May! Edem in May! Everywhere Rome went, they would always support the local ruling elite. So for people like Prasutagus, who became a client king, they realized that their land, their property, their wealth, their position in society was going to be backed up and endorsed by Rome. And he preserved, nominally at any rate, some measure of independence for his nation. Little did the Iceni royal family realize that their independence would be short-lived. This was a deal with the devil. The peace they enjoyed was just the calm before the storm. But for now, Boudicca felt secure. The Iceni were an advanced society which saw themselves very much as equals to the Romans. I think there's some notion that compared to the Roman people, the Iron Age people were somehow backward, barbarians that needed civilizing. And I would very much disagree with that. Anyone who studies Iron Age Britain can tell you that it was a very rich cultural place. And we absolutely should not see the native Britons waiting for the Romans to come just so they can at last have hot and cold running water, learn Latin and wear togas. That was not the case. They were very artistic. The Snetisham Horde, the torques and the brooches that were found there, showed a level of workmanship that is unmatched anywhere in the ancient world. This is a fantastic torque of eight by eight woven wires. And nowhere, China, Europe, the Americas, anywhere was there anybody capable of that level of workmanship in gold at that time. We have a wonderful hoard of gold and silver neck rings from a place called Snedisham in Norfolk. This is one of the richest treasures of gold and silver jewellery from Iron Age Europe. They struck their own coinage. Uh, they had a very developed monetary system. These people were not savages. They had a centralised state with the royal family, uh, they were very much ruled from the centre outwards and they achieved quite a sophisticated political organisation. Signing a treaty with the Romans was a shrewd move. It meant that chieftains like Prasutagus avoided their people being stripped of their weapons. 
And it made him very wealthy. But in AD 60, it all went terribly wrong. The one person who bound the Iceni to the Romans, Boudicca's husband, King Prasutagus, died. In the days that followed, as Boudicca mourned, the greater significance of her husband's death would become horribly clear. Peace would be shattered. Rome would be shaken. Thousands would die. Little did she realize it, but Boudicca was looking into the abyss. When Boudicca's husband, King Prasutagus, died in AD 60, the flames that consumed his body were about to consume his people. Despite being a client kingdom to the Romans, there was a long simmering cauldron of differences between the Britons and their conquerors. Julius Caesar, who was a god, the greatest hero, the greatest general Rome had ever known, had attempted to take Britain and had failed twice in a row. He lost most of his ships, he lost all of his men. He said, I came, I saw, I conquered, and that was so much spin. He came, he was completely jumped on. He managed to achieve one small trading treaty and he buggered off home again as fast as he could. If Claudius could do something better than that, then he would have established himself in the eyes of the people. By 43 AD, Emperor Claudius decided to do what Caesar couldn't and bring the wayward island under Roman control. So he sent four legions. He sent a minimum of 40,000 men, as far as we know in the biggest invasion fleet Britain has ever seen. This was by far bigger than the Armada. The expansion of the empire was ensured by the ruthless efficiency of their army. See how the brow ridge forces the blade away from my face. And the neck guard protects the back of the neck. So they were forever perfecting their armory for the times and the style of, of weapon of the opponent. Right? And that's why the Romans were so successful, because they learned from the people they were fighting, took what was best, adapted it, and then made it better. Those clever Romans, eh? Oh, I hate it when that happens. It's a short thrusting sword, twist, pull it out. Nasty. But it'll disable you and you will die. You will die at some point straight after through septicemia, gangrene, something like that. No antibiotics, no medicine, nothing to save you. Charming. Well, the Romans would just want to get rid of their enemies, and that's a surgical way. Right. You imagine now, five and a half thousand dollars, human chainsaw advancing down the hill towards you. Each man surgically thrusting, killing, killing, killing. And this is where the Romans are using psychology as well as military technology. This armor is worth in, in terms of property Something like a small village, so say three quarters of a million dollars, and every single Roman soldier is equipped like this. Whereas in the British culture, the noble might have this amount of armour, but the rest are fighting, even one of the sources is fighting with sharpened sticks, not even spears. So say five and a half thousand armoured men marching over that hill, 
it's, it's gleaming gonna, in the sun. Absolutely polished to, to shine. And then with lots of rattling noise, it's going to psych you out. You're not going to want to fight. It was a clash of two ancient cultures. The Britons had been developing their island culture for 10,000 years. The Romans, on the other hand, spread their culture by conquering much of the known world. And they did it with amazing efficiency. Like this water wheel, rebuilt at the Museum of London, the Romans brought undeniable technological progress. With this one machine, a handful of slaves could provide enough water for hundreds of Roman households every day. There is no doubt that the Romans saw themselves in Northern Europe as the flag bearers for a higher civilization. And in fact, although it's uh, politically incorrect to say this, they were absolutely right. They came from a world that had the Parthenon, it had great architecture, it was backed up by everything that was good in Greek and indeed Roman law and philosophy. And there is no doubt that the cultures they came in contact with in Northern Europe were politically and intellectually not quite so advanced. Julie, where do we get the idea that early Britons painted themselves blue? Caesar tells us in his Gallic Wars, when he visited Britain in 55, 54 BC, he remarks that the people of southeastern Britain painted themselves blue with woad. Well, it comes from the, the woad plant, and how to make the blue is you take the woad leaves and you boil them in boiling water, and then you need to add ammonia, which perhaps would have been in the form of urine in the Iron Age. And then as you boil all these chopped leaves in urine and water, the blue pigment of the leaves comes out and sinks to the bottom, and then you tip away the water and the plant matter, and then you're left with this blue pigment. Okay, I'm just gonna paint it. On my arm here. When I first did this recipe, I painted it on a friend of mine who is in the army or was in the army, and he told me that the colour that was produced with beef fat and woad was the same colour as used in the British Army camouflage palette to, to break up the face of the soldier, but it would have had the same effect as making a person invisible at dawn and dusk. I think, if they went into battle. I mean, can you imagine how great that is to be able to go into battle invisible? I mean, no wonder the ancient Brits believed in this sort of thing. So, Jilly, how long would this remain on the body? Well, this would wash off immediately, which is kind of useful because if you're an ancient Brit with Roman friends and you don't want to betray your, your native identity or something, you can just wash it off immediately before going to meet your Roman friends. Alternatively, if you were to dye the body with woad, that would stay on for several weeks. You'd have to wait till it wore off. Mm -hmm. And if you really wanted to make it stay on forever, of course, you can tattoo it. You just break off a thorn from the nearest bush, prick it into your skin, rub in the woad, and you have your tattoo. And I think that Britons who really wanted to rebel against the Romans, but in a silent way, could tattoo their designs on their body and cover it with their clothes. So when the Roman soldiers are walking past, they could perhaps roll up their sleeves and nudge, nudge, wink, wink to each other. And so the Romans wouldn't see. So what's in this, Jilly? Well, it's woad and the binding agent we've used in this particular example is semen. Pardon? <laughs> it's semen. So not only does woad make you look good, it makes you feel funky. And I can well imagine charging into war and totally freaking out those Romans. Boudicca's cultural heritage was more under threat than she thought. The land on which their very existence depended was about to be taken out from under them. They were tremendously productive. There was more land under the plough in the south of England at that time than at any point until after the end of the First World War in this country. Caesar had never seen so fecund a country. I think amongst the Iceni, there was a real sense of continuity. These people had farmed the same land for not just generations, but for centuries and centuries. And really, it had been theirs, if you like, forever. Like native peoples all over the world, early Britons held land in common. But to the Romans, land was money. They handed out parcels of land to old centurions for their retirement. So today's Iceni village could be tomorrow's Roman retirement villa. There's one group of early Britons we've all heard of, the Druids. The Druids are the key to who the Britons were. This was our indigenous shamanic cultural base. It had been growing for 5,000 years. 
it, it was the pinnacle of evolution, of a connection between the people and the land. They were the people who established a system of justice and maintained it. Without question, they would have a political leaning, and that political leaning would be anti-Roman, because Rome imposed other gods. Rome imposed other ways of being. Rome broke the connection between the people and the gods of the land. The Druids were also the only force that held the disparate and often quarrelsome British tribes together. Rome knew that to conquer Britain, they had to conquer the Druids. And the man for that job was the new governor, Gaius Suetonius Paulinus. Suetonius had been part of the Roman suppression in Mauritania. He had led his troops across the Atlas Mountains. He was the first Roman to have done that. So he was very, very good at mountain warfare. And at the time he was appointed, the west of Britain was the focus of Roman warfare. Wales, we had the mountains of Wales. They had to cross through Snowdonia to get to Anglesey, to get to the Druids. They wanted someone who the troops could trust to lead them across the mountains. And he was brutal, without question. I think he was brutal before he got here and he was certainly brutal once he got here. By the time of Prasutagus' death in AD 60, the Druids were holed up on the island of Anglesey off North Wales. Suetonius had specific orders to crush them. Roman historian Tacitus tells of how the Druids were attacked and slaughtered. On the opposite shore stood the Britons. Women ran through the ranks in wild disorder, resembling the frantic rage of the Furies. The Druids were ranged in order, with hands uplifted invoking the gods. The Romans advanced their standards and rushed onto the attack with impetuous fury. The Britons perished in the flames, which they themselves had kindled. The actual wiping out or the extermination of a foreign nation uh, was part and parcel of Roman foreign policy. They didn't actually have a word for genocide, but it's quite clear from remarks made by Roman emperors that they saw nothing necessarily reprehensible about wiping out in its entirety a Celtic or a Germanic or indeed a British nation. If it suited them, so to do. It was a time of Roman expansion. The empire had already crushed Celtic tribes in Western Europe and now wanted to do the same thing in Britain. The policy of client kingdoms was finished. Native tribes like the Iceni would have to choose. Were they with Rome or against it? The Roman governor, Suetonius, hadn't been assigned his job to be considerate of local feelings, but his job hadn't been made any easier by the new emperor in Rome, Nero. Nero wanted money. Prasutagus got the support of Rome, and he got the finances of Rome. Seneca tells us that the emperor alone had invested 40 million sesterces in loans to the British tribes, which was a phenomenal amount of money. We're talking millions of pounds equivalent in currency. Money is the root of all evil, and so it turned out in the run-up to the Boudican Revolt. The Roman administration, very foolishly as it turned out, attempted to try and um, treat these gifts of money as loans, and they tried to call them in. And of course, by this time, the Britons had spent the money, and it would have actually been very, very difficult for a lot of these kings, certainly in East Anglia, to have raised that amount of ready cash. We know that the procurator was, was not a gentleman even by Roman standards, and Roman tax collectors were not renowned for their delicate means. I think it will have been very similar to living in Nazi-occupied France. Life still seemed peaceful for Boudicca and the Iceni, isolated up in what is today the county of Norfolk. With King Prasutica's dead, Boudicca was to rule the Iceni until her daughters were old enough. Like many early societies, the Iceni had no problem with a woman ruler, but the Romans did. Women had no rights under Roman law. 
They were the property of their fathers or husbands from birth till death. The Romans would recognize neither Boudicca nor her daughters as rightful heirs. They demanded that all Iceni lands be handed over to Rome. The Roman procurator, who is not a pleasant man, is sent in to claim what is the emperor's. And as far as he's concerned, everything is the emperor's. Half of it was the emperor's in the will, half of it was given to the daughters. Daughters are women, women don't count. Thank you, we'll take the lot. He gives the Imperatore. Nay! Cut at this knee! Duque et is obsequium duque. Ecce Regina. Before the Romans invaded Icenian territory, we do believe that the Iceni, both Boudicca and Prasutagus, were very pro-Roman. They were in favour of the Romans and they were happy to make deals with the Romans. But after this happened, obviously Boudicca changed her mind. Brutality, treachery, and the rape of her children tore at Boudicca's heart. <laughs> this was the moment that changed Britain forever. Boudicca's revenge would be apocalyptic. They say hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Imagine the fury that screamed for revenge in Boudicca's blood. Her people impoverished, her body scourged, her children violated. Boudicca's wrath would mean death for the Romans and anyone with them. Boudicca built an army tens of thousands strong. While the Roman governor Suetonius was off in Wales slaughtering Druids, she mustered the support of neighboring tribes like the Trinovantes in Eastern Britain. When the Romans came to Britain, they made their headquarters at Colchester, and Colchester was the capital town of the Trinovantian people. And when the Romans moved to Colchester, they enslaved many of the native Britons, they kicked them off their, off their, out of their houses and off their land. They also built many forts in Trinovantian territory, and also the Trinovantes had to pay and give money for the building of the Temple of Claudius in Colchester. We know from the Roman historian Tacitus that this temple was looked upon with particular hatred. It was looked upon as, and I quote, the citadel of an everlasting tyranny. And when the revolt breaks out in AD 60, one of the reasons why the Trinovantes joined the revolt is that they want to destroy Colchester, lock, stock and barrel, and especially the Temple of Claudius. As they descended on the Roman town of Colchester, not a single defence stood in their way. The Romans had no idea what would hit them.
When Budiko gets here, the town was burnt to the ground. The population was wiped out in its entirety. What really Budiko wanted to do, I think, was to put the clock back to before the Roman invasion of Britain. The Khmer Rouge and Pol Pot, what they wanted to do was to obliterate and physically destroy anything which they saw as foreign. They wanted to wipe the slate clean and start all over again. The last surviving Romans gathered together in the Temple of Claudius. They held out for two days. Eventually, they were overwhelmed as well, and they were put to the sword. And Roman Colchester, as a functioning entity, had simply ceased to exist. Having slaughtered Colchester's 20,000, Boudicca's army swept across the country, destroying everything in its path. Farmers were faced with a stark choice. Either join the rebellion or die. Boudicca had unleashed an uncontrollable hatred against all things Roman. When Suetonius heard of the revolt, he left his troops chasing Druids in Wales and raced back east, covering 180 miles in only four days. Reinforcements were sent to save Colchester, but too late. The would-be saviors walked straight into Boudicca's trap. At least 1,500 Romans died. You come in at the sides on this line of marching men, and wipe them out. It was brilliant, um, and a brilliant morale booster for us, and a brilliant morale destroyer for the Romans. Um, of four legions, they now have three. Boudicca was just beginning her reign of terror. Now her enraged hordes were heading for that well-known center of foreigners, London. Suetonius arrived in London just ahead of Boudicca. As he descended down into the Thames Valley, he couldn't know that the person who'd unleashed this terror was a woman. The idea of a woman warrior was completely against the Roman mentality. But Suetonius had a more immediate dilemma. Should he stay and protect London, or should he flee and live to fight another day? The heady attraction of blood, loot, and revenge swelled Boudicca's horde to nearly 100,000. Without his troops, Suetonius took what Romans he could and abandoned the city to its fate. Because he was a brilliant general, he decided to sacrifice London, which can't have been an easy decision because it was indefensible. And because he couldn't get his men down there in time and he wasn't about to fight a battle he was going to lose. Boudicca's army leveled London and massacred its 10,000 inhabitants, Romans and Britons alike. In a strange twist of fate, Roman officials were forced to try out their own instrument of punishment, the crucifix. Both Boudicca and Suetonius must have believed that they were fighting for a better world. Strange then that dreams of utopia so often end in murder. We know that the only people who stayed behind were the elderly, uh, the infirm people who were attached to the place, but of course they were put to the sword, they were slaughtered. The attack enveloped London in a firestorm of 1,000 degrees centigrade. 13 feet below today's London lies a layer of scorched earth, the enduring legacy of the Holocaust, known to archaeologists as the Boudicca Destruction Layer. After burning down many buildings in London and killing many of the people there, Boudicca and her army then went on to St Albans. And the reason why they chose St Albans is because the Catavalloni tribe who lived in that part of the country had become quite pro-Roman. 
St Albans itself, or Verulamium, had been made a municipium, which was sort of like a secondary town, one down from a colonia, which was the, the status of the colony at Colchester. And so obviously, because these people had become pro-Roman, this was enough to make Boudicca and her followers extremely angry, and it was a good reason for choosing St Albans for destruction. Greek historian Cassius Dyer, writing 150 years later, saw Boudicca as a monstrous figure, a bloodthirsty terrorist responsible for the deaths of up to 70,000. And he may have been right. She was an ethnic cleanser. She did terrible, terrible things. Thousands of people died. She was a freedom fighter though. It wasn't her fault that she found herself confronted by an enemy, the greatness of which she could only dimly comprehend. You go in and you go in as hard as you possibly can and you don't stop until one or other side is won because you're fighting to save your culture. This is your last chance. After the sacking of St Albans, Suetonius knew that if he didn't stop the revolt soon, not a Roman would be left alive in Britain. Most historians believe he assembled his troops near Mansetta in the Midlands to prepare for the final showdown. Suetonius was no fool. He chose his terrain carefully, placed his men at the narrow end of a valley. The rear would be protected by the woods. The Britons would be forced to fight on Roman terms and to attack uphill in a pitched battle. Why would Boudicca choose to do this when she'd had so much success with guerrilla tactics? He knew what he was doing, Suetonius Polanus. We couldn't come in at the sides, we couldn't come in from the back. But it looks as if he's trapped himself in a place from which there is no retreat. Suetonius must have been under serious pressure. After three defeats, the Emperor Nero would be demanding a victory. The numbers involved in the battle were enormous. There were somewhere between 100 and 200,000 Britons. They were so confident of destroying the 11,000 Romans that they brought their families to see the fun. Sitting in wagons at the back, the spectators blocked any escape from the field of battle. Part of the reason you took your families is that I think it's very possible both parents were fighting. You bring the kids along, who's going to stay behind and look after them? Um, so it was a family war. Everybody was out there fighting. There was the Roman governor Suetonius, his back literally against the wall. With the Romans' only option, death, they had no chance but to fight to the last man. Two legions, each of about 5,000 men, ready to clash head on with the British hordes. And here was Boudicca, a woman driven by revenge and fury, set to avenge her humiliation, her daughter's violation, and her people's threatened annihilation. Ancient historians say both leaders exhorted their troops before the battle. Ut spernerent sonoris, barbarorum et inanes minus. This is not the first time the Britons have been led into battle by a woman. But now I do not come to boast the pride of a long line of ancestry, nor even to recover my kingdom and the plundered wealth of my family, but for all our liberty! Despise the savage uproar, the yells and shouts of undisciplined barbarians. In that mixed multitude, the women outnumber the men. They are not soldiers who come to offer battle. They are bastards. Runaways, the refuse of your swords. The vindictive gods are at hand. Look, how the Romans even now shrink back in terror. In all engagements, it is the valor of a few that turns the fortune of the day. Conquer, and victory gives you everything. Parta victoria cuncta, ipsis censura. On this spot, we must.
must either conquer or die with glory. There is no alternative. Mandate! Suetonius finally saw his enemy. Not the barbarian man he had expected, but a woman, tall, proud, and as ready to die as he was himself. Roman javelins fell thousands. Those who weren't killed outright had a two-meter javelin sticking out of their shield and had to throw it away. They were killed in the next volley. The bodies mounted up. The Britons fought as individuals. The Romans fought as one killing machine. Cuneum facite! The Romans closed ranks into an impenetrable wedge. They drew their swords and cut a bloody path through the mass of Britons, forcing the disorganized tribes back on themselves. The Britons were pushed back against the wall of wagons, crushing men, women and children alike. Most of the Britons were probably actually killed by suffocation, where the sheer weight of people pressing in on these wagons meant that they were actually crushed to death, much as, sadly, we've seen people crushed to death in disasters in football stadiums. They killed them all. Um, and I think it would have been slaughter at the end, because who was left in the wagons were the people who couldn't fight. Boudicca is said to have survived the massacre. For a warrior woman like Boudicca, defeat must have been a fate much worse than death. The chance was there and to have lost it. And to know that that was the last chance. Because you have denuded the East, there's nobody left there. Once they're all dead, Polanus is just going to march back across, laying waste to everything. You would stand on the battlefield knowing that this was the end of everything that he cherished, yes. I think it would be completely devastating. In one brief battle, the Romans had destroyed Boudicca's world, including her daughters. In the first great battle of Britain, the Romans lost only 400 men. 80,000 Britons are said to have died. Boudicca's fate was sealed. Suetonius is going to march through. Once he's killed everybody here, he is going to sweep on. And he's going to make sure nobody ever rises again. So you're looking at the end of a culture, the end of everything that I've cherished and I've lived for and I've fought for for all of my life ends on that battlefield. 
I wouldn't want to come off it alive. It would be it would be a lot better to go down fighting that day than to s stay alive and witness what happened. What happened to Boudicca? There are only stories left. Cassius Dio said she died peacefully, while Tacitus says she poisoned herself in despair. Boudicca is said to be buried all over the place, from here at Stonehenge to just under Platform 8 here at King's Cross Station, to here atop Parliament Hill overlooking London. The truth is nobody knows where Boudicca is buried, but however she died and wherever she is, the Romans would never face another serious rebellion in Britain. They stayed on 400 years, changing Britain forever. Had the Britons won, I'm sure that the Romans would never ever have bothered or attempted to invade Britain again. We here would have been living in what was a continuation of a very long cultural tradition based in the land if we'd maintained a tribal unity, we'd maintained a warrior culture, I think we could have kept them out. So no Anglo-Saxon invasion, so no Norman invasion. So the whole history is completely different. So if Boudicca had of won instead of the Romans, then the history of Britain and indeed the world would have been completely different. Would Americans, Canadians, Indians, even New Zealanders like me be speaking some sort of Celtic language? It's a bizarre thought, but you too could be looking this good. It all goes back to Boudicca's last stand. She is a parable of culture clash in its most brutal and uncompromising fashion. She found herself pitchforked against a world which she could only dimly fully comprehend. Ultimately, she was a failure. She was a spectacular failure. She led herself and her nation to disaster. Look at this. Boudicca would turn in her grave. The warrior woman who lost everything fighting one empire was used shamelessly to represent another. In the 1800s, Boudicca was revived as the pin-up girl for the British Empire by none other than Prince Albert as a present for his wife, Boudicca's namesake, Queen Victoria. History can be as cruel as it is ironic. But perhaps the Victorians did understand the essence of empire and the essence of Boudicca. Part heroine, part terrorist. Just what you need to build an empire, or destroy it. And by the way, why do so many people call her Bodicea? At some point, some medieval scribe sitting in his cell, transcribing by candlelight, gets the U and makes it into an A. And gets the second C and makes it into an E and you have Bodicea. <laughs>